when you're first starting out and you're looking for someone to walk you through this diagnosis process, I would start by asking for a recommendation from anyone that you know who has a familiarity with ADHD. They've been diagnosed, their child's been diagnosed, their grandchild's been diagnosed, and ask them, do you know anyone who really knows ADHD and knows ADHD in women? So if there's nobody there, you don't know anybody, then I would ask your primary care physician if they have any recommendations. Thomas Edison, Richard Branson, John F. Kennedy, Mozart, Michael Jordan, Will Smith. That sounds like a list of highly successful titans in a variety of vocations. Why is it that we rarely hear that they have or had ADHD? And you know what we hear even less about? Serena Williams, Emma Watson, Mel Robbins, Whoopi Goldberg, Agatha Christie, Aaron Brockovich, Cher. Yeah, the successful women navigating ADHD. And that's exactly why I started this podcast, ADHD for Smartass Women. I'm your host, Tracy Otsuka. I'm a lawyer, not a doctor, a lifelong student, now a coach. I'm also the creator of Your ADHD Brain is A-OK, a system that helps people like you figure out what they should do with their life. And we're here today to talk ADHD, your strengths, your symptoms, your workarounds, and how you proudly stand out instead of trying to fit in. I credit my ADHD for some of my greatest gifts. And you know what? I spy a happier life for you too. So without further ado, a shiny new episode is starting now. Hello, I am Tracy Otsuka, and I wanted to thank you so much for joining me here for episode number 199 of ADHD for Smartass Women. I hope you'll subscribe to this podcast and our newsletter over at tracyotsuka.com. My purpose is always to show you who you are and then inspire you to be it. And you know what? In the thousands of ADHD women that I've had the privilege of meeting, I've never met a one that wasn't truly brilliant at something, not one, and that includes you. Now, before we start today's podcast, I would like to share a podcast review. This one is a little bit long, so I'm just going to do one, but I just want to acknowledge all of you for taking the time to write your reviews. I know none of us ever have enough time, so I can't tell you how much I appreciate you. They really do help to spread the word so that the that, so that we can reach even more women with ADHD. I'm tripping all over my words. Okay, so let's start with this review from Lauren Hancock in Arkansas. And she titles it Lifted Weight, Broken Chains. Tracy, phew. I'm emotional putting my feelings to written word. In summary, thank you. Thank you, thank you, thank you. I am 36, a mom to two priceless treasures as daughters, both fantastic little artists and honor students. I've been an emergency room nurse practitioner since 2011, having been an ER registered nurse for three years prior, and an ER nursing assistant several years prior to that. In undergrad, I served as a resident assistant of one of the larger all-female dormitories, and at the end of my freshman year, I was asked to lead my sororities chapter relations team, the goal of being an arm of support and ever available encouragement while guiding members and maintaining the chapter's academic and behavioral standards. Oh my God, Lauren, I'd be breaking all of them. (laughs) What she goes on to say is not the most pleasant office to chair, especially as an upcoming sophomore. All this to say that I felt for the last number of years that I'm failing at life. Truly immensely failing, to the point that I felt sadness for my husband and children and that they deserved someone far better, someone more organized, more consistent, more stable in the day-to-day. I've always said without exaggeration, my stress level while working in our large and incredibly busy emergency department is around a two, while at home it's a 10. 
After becoming a mom eight years ago, then a mom of two five years ago, and having a very linear-minded husband of 17 years, he's amazing, but damn, he's interpreted my last several years as unmotivated, lazy, emotionally shut, in a state of disarray, a sorry example to our children, and very little of what I used to be. And sadly, a part of me bought into those beliefs, even with being diagnosed with ADD seven years ago and beginning medication, which helped incredibly. I've struggled at putting who I am into sentence form. Depression after losing my grandmother to Parkinson's kept me taking long midday naps on my off days and sped up my addiction to shopping. My kids shouldn't have a mom like this, I've told myself. I came across your podcast two weeks ago, and Tracy, I can honestly say you and your incredible and brave guest speakers, and yes, I have many of them, (laughs) have helped me to actually feel the warmth of the sun again. Negative reinforcement, mainly from myself, has nearly done my soul in. But you've shown me that what I am and not what I'm not, nor ever will be, regardless of my efforts, is a gift of an uncommon brilliance. Thank you, thank you, with tears rolling down. Now you're going to make me cry, Lauren. Thank you. The conversations of you and your guest speakers describe me, my roadblocks, my idiosyncrasies. And now I can finally stand up for who I am via words, understandable to those not suffering from ADD. Lauren, you are exactly why I do this, and I deal with all of the things that require so much executive function in producing this podcast, but I just keep doing it because I get words like yours and I know that I am making a difference. And what we know with ADHD women is that we need to feel like our life has meaning. We need to feel like we're making a difference more than frankly, your neurotypical population does. And so to you, I say, absolutely, focus on your strengths, stay in your positive emotion. You are clearly brilliant. You've accomplished so much. And the world, and especially those little girls, and even that husband, he just needs to be set right a little bit, right? But even your husband, they need you. They really, really need you. Our kinds of brains are needed, are creative, somewhat all over the place, empathetic, kind, funny. Yeah, that kind of brain is needed. So thank you so much for sharing um, sharing this information with me, writing that review. Okay, so this week I am going to talk about how to prepare for a meeting with a doctor to discuss your ADHD. And I talked about this a couple of years ago at the beginning of the podcast, but I thought it was worthy of a redo because so many of you have never listened to that episode. Now, this question has come up a lot in our big group, ADHD for Smart Ass Women. I've had so many women reach out to me personally and directly asking for this information. And of course, I've had so many women ask for it when I run, you know, my five days to fall in love with your ADHD brain, my free training. And then of course, in my Your ADHD Brain is A-OK program as well. What I've noticed is that a lot of women are fearful and stressed out by the prospect of having to meet with their general practitioner, their family doctor, their psychologist, or their psychiatrist to discuss their ADHD. Now, what we're worried about is this, right? We know it's ADHD. And I really, what I always stress is if your gut is telling you, you know, you've done a bunch of research and your gut is telling you, oh my gosh, this is exactly what is going on with me. Stick with that. Because In my experience, what I've seen is we know better what's going on with us than they do, all of them. So stick with it. And if one doctor tells you, nope, that's not what it is, go find someone else. Because chances are that doctor does not know what ADHD looks like in women. So anyway, what we're worried about is we know it's ADHD, right? And we're afraid that um, we've done all this research and we're afraid we're going to get a doctor who is not an expert in ADHD or they've got outdated information about ADHD, which would mean they're not an expert, right? Who's going to tell you that you're wrong. We're also worried that 
at least, you know, I know I was worried about this and I hear this from women all the time, that that doctor is going to think that you're lying about the ADHD and you're basically just a medication seeker, right? And I mean, I'm so crazy about medication in terms of I will do everything I can not to take medication first. Like I'll try all the other strategies, right? So I am not the kind of person who just goes around trying to get medication. But I was worried that that's what they were going to think. Now, I'll tell you that the main reason that I finally did get diagnosed, because I was certain I had it, my son had been diagnosed, but I had heard so many stories about how ADHD medication had literally changed women's lives. And I was hoping that I would be one of them. So I wanted to try that. Now, as you probably know, I wasn't, right? I'm actually part of that 20% who the medication does nothing for but create worse symptoms. So I wasn't not telling the truth to get medication. I was telling my truth, but I definitely did want to try medication. That was the main reason that I wanted to get diagnosed. You know, of course, I wanted confirmation too that what I believed to be uh, true was actually true. I had done a lot of research primarily for my son, but I had also done research for myself about how the ADHD presents in women that I was certain that I had ADHD, but I was still nervous because I was afraid that what I knew to be true would be challenged. So what ended up happening is I initially met with a psychologist who asked me a bunch of questions about my childhood, what I felt were my challenges, if the symptoms had gotten worse as I'd gotten older. And then she gave me a bunch of rating scales to measure my ADHD symptoms. And they were just, um, you know, forms basically where they would ask me questions and I had to answer them. So I took all that home. I also took home, she gave me a, um, a rating scale that my husband had to fill out about me. Now, one of the problems with ADHD is that there is no test you can take. There is no blood test. There is no snapshot of your brain that they can look at and say, oh, there's definitely ADHD, right? Instead, what doctors do is they rely on interviews, on questionnaires, and rating scales to measure the symptoms of ADHD. For kids, they do more, and I'm going to get into that in a little bit. Now, so I took these rating scales home, I filled them out, and then I came back a week later. And while I was sitting in uh, the same psychologist's office, she scored the forms and she gave me the ADHD diagnosis. And then she asked me if I was interested in medication. And I said, yes. So she gave me a referral. I made an appointment for a week later with um, a psychiatrist. It was, you know, it was years ago. It was pretty easy to get in at that time. Now, when I met with the psychiatrist, he must have honestly spent at most 15 minutes with me. And we didn't talk about anything that I remember. There was no discussion about the different kinds of medication, you know, stimulant or non-stimulant. There was no discussion about non-pharmacological options that I could do with medication or instead of medication, you know, things like exercise. He just handed me a prescription for Adderall. And I should mention that I'm in California, so in the United States, and I'm part of Kaiser, which is basically an HMO. I think it's the biggest HMO in the country. So the process may be very different depending on where you are and what kind of health coverage you have. Since then, I've been re-diagnosed by Lori Peterson's company, uh, eDiagnostic Learning. She has been on our podcast a couple times. Her diagnostic protocol was much more thorough. And my understanding is that e-diagnostic learning now has a program specifically designed to test women for ADHD. I think it's pretty reasonable too, um, when you consider how much this normally costs. Now, I'm in California. E-diagnostic learning is in Texas. If you were interested in medication, what you'd have to do is take her results to your psychiatrist or doctor. And I would talk to Lori and the people at e-diagnostic learning about that because I think it depends on what state you know you're in and um, who your doctor is and whether they take that uh, diagnosis and be willing to prescribe medication based on it. So um, anyway, my son Marcus's diagnosis was much more thorough. He had similar rating scale forms, but this time um, he filled one out 
We filled one out as his parents. His principal filled one out, his principal of his school. He was 12 at the time. And his primary teacher filled one out. So as I said, his first testing was at age 12 and it lasted the better part of a day. I want to say we were there probably for six hours. They also gave him the Wexler Intelligence Scale Test. They call it a WISC. So it was the WISC-4. And this test is given to assess cognitive function and ability. So when I went back, now that I think about it, and took the test with uh, Lori Peterson's company, I believe I was given a cognitive uh, test as well. It wasn't the Wexler intelligence test. I believe it was the Woodcock Johnson, maybe an adult version of it. That's what I remember. So anyway, this Wexler WISC-4, this test is given to assess cognitive function and ability. So they're looking for giftedness. They're looking for learning disabilities, for strengths and weaknesses in kids' cognitive abilities. Now, cognitive skill or function just means the ability to perform various mental activities associated with learning and problem solving. So things like sustained attention, things like the speed that you process information, your working memory, so stuff like that. So when Marcus was 16, right before he started his junior year of high school, we had him retested. And the doctor met with him one or two times a month for the summer before he even retook that test. And this time, the psychoeducational evaluation included the Woodcock Johnson 3 battery of tests. Now, I thought these tests were far superior to the WIST test. It was so much more comprehensive, and it really helped us and him to pinpoint what his strengths and relative weaknesses were. I talked to Lori Peterson over at eDiagnostic Learning about the Woodcock Johnson three battery of tests. And now that I think about it, I don't think I took Woodcock Johnson. I actually think I took the Wexler or part of the Wexler. And so I talked to Lori about this and she disagreed with me. She said that she prefers the WISC test. And of course she's the expert, but I will say as a parent for me, the Woodcock Johnson, it just gave me so much more information to really pinpoint, you know, what Marcus's strengths were and what his relative weaknesses were. And so what was it that we really needed to focus on in the strengths, right? So this is the test that really turned me into a tiger mom when it came to fighting for Marcus, you know, with his teachers. So it just allowed me to understand, again, what he was really good at, much better than, than the WIST test. So Marcus is one of those kids that can calculate numbers really fast in his head, and he's just always been really good at math, yet that's the subject he's hated the most, and this just never made sense to me. Well, when we took the Woodcock-Johnson test, he was generally in the 98th percentile in math. And at that point, I guess that what was really going on was he was bored because he didn't feel challenged. Now we know, you know, he's since been diagnosed with dyslexia. And we think that that is really what has added to his struggles in math because what we noticed is he was really good at math until algebra and calculus came into the picture. And that's when we started mix, you know, in calculus in algebra, you start mixing the numbers much more so than numbers with the letters. So anyway, these tests are all expensive. So depending on, you know, where you are and how many specialists are available in your area, it can be anywhere from, I'd say $750 to $2,000 and up. Okay. So this is what testing and obtaining an ADHD diagnosis looked like for me and my son personally. So let's say you want to get tested. Where should you start? Well, if money is no object, or if you're in an area where doctors don't believe in ADHD because they're not trained, in that case, even if money is an object, I would research and find a psychologist who specialized in ADHD. In fact, come to think of it, I would always look for that. So I'd look for a psychologist who specializes in ADHD in your area, and I would pay out of pocket if I could afford to do that. I should also say that depending on what state you're in, you may not um, have to have a psychologist. It may be that there is a therapist or a social worker in your state that is allowed to diagnose ADHD and who also specializes in ADHD. Because I'll tell you, it's not easy, you know, to find mental health professionals who actually specialize in ADHD. 
Sadly, psychiatry is the least respected field in medicine. Many people don't even regard psychiatrists as medical doctors. And this isn't just among the public. This is also among health professionals. And I think certainly among the public, I think that because we have psychologists who are not medical doctors and psychiatrists who are medical doctors, there's a lot of confusion there, right? But that means that fewer and fewer doctors are choosing this specialty. I know that child psychiatrists, they're kind of like dinosaurs, right? They are so rare and everybody is looking for them. So what I did is I initially went to Kaiser. That is my HMO to get diagnosed. But when I discovered that the psychiatrist who prescribed my Adderall, which caused me a lot of anxiety, really knew little to nothing about ADHD beyond you prescribe Adderall or Ritalin, I found a psychiatrist who had been the head of women's mental health in Northern California for Kaiser. And she cost me $600 an hour Um, That was out of pocket, and I'm sure she's much more now. And it wasn't long before I realized that I was just a science experiment, right? Even working with her who had so much knowledge and really did know ADHD. So I was a science experiment, and I was funding that science experiment, right? I knew she was very knowledgeable about ADHD, but there are no magic pills if medication doesn't work for you, right? And even if meds work, right? It's not a magic pill. Um. Oftentimes, medication can create more symptoms than benefits. And unfortunately, I was one of those people that um, experienced that. And there's no choice but to just try and see what works for you. So we are all science experiments. And if you're not lucky and the first one or two medications don't work, just expect that that's what you're going to have to do. You're going to have to just try and see what works for you. I want you to remember that all brains are unique and different. So just because your friend, right, was on a medication for ADHD and it's changed her life, it doesn't mean that you're going to be as successful. Okay. So what works for one patient doesn't necessarily work for another patient. All that said, When you're first starting out and you're looking for someone to walk you through this diagnosis process, I would start by asking for a recommendation from anyone that you know who has a familiarity with ADHD. They've been diagnosed, their child's been diagnosed, their grandchild's been diagnosed, and ask them, do you know anyone who really knows ADHD and knows ADHD in women? So you need a psychologist. I should have said this earlier, but the psychologist is typically the one who will diagnose ADHD. The psychiatrist is the one that will usually write the prescription for medication. However, any medical doctor can write a prescription for medication. And depending on what state you're in, social workers and therapists may also be able to diagnose ADHD. A psychiatrist can also diagnose ADHD, but typically they're the ones that um, write prescriptions for medication. So if there's nobody there, you don't know anybody, then I would ask your primary care physician if they have any recommendations. Most ADHD diagnoses for kids come from pediatricians, and that's fine if they're trained in ADHD, but most of them aren't. So if I'm going to consider giving my child stimulant medication, I want to know that an expert in ADHD has diagnosed him or her first. Now, I know I'm asking for a lot here, but my new policy for a lot of things is that if you haven't personally experienced it, you're not expert enough for me. So if I want to learn how to surf, you've heard me say this before, I'm not going to hire someone who's never surfed and just watches other people surf. If I want to learn how to cook, I'm not going to hire someone who's never cooked, but gets all of his knowledge from watching others cook. So why would I trust my brain to anything less? To me, firsthand experience, especially with ADHD, is really important. There is so much misinformation about it, right? And people that have ADHD, they just get it. So the best purposes, I believe, give meaning to our past. They've lived it. I think about the best math tutor my son has ever worked with is the one um, who had ADHD. He understood my son and his brain, and he could suggest things that finally did work for Marcus because they worked for him. So my recommendation is when you're looking for an ADHD specialist, whether it's a psychologist, a psychiatrist, a coach, a therapist, do whatever you can do to find one of us. And it's interesting. Um... But what I have noticed, certainly since COVID, is there are a lot of psychologists, psychiatrists, 
therapists and obviously coaches who are getting out there and are being really, you know, forthcoming about the fact that they struggle with ADHD as well. They've been diagnosed with ADHD. So it's getting easier to find that. And if I'm really reaching for the sky, I want a female psychologist and psychiatrist who has ADHD. Why female? The same reason, right? ADHD presents differently in women, and this is only now being studied. So for decades, ADHD in girls and women, it was just missed because it didn't always look like the stereotypical seven-year-old ADHD boy who was bouncing off the walls. I also believe that there is something akin to midlife ADHD, and we talked about that in one of our podcasts. So Women who had symptoms of ADHD since childhood, but they didn't reach the level of interference to classify as ADHD until midlife when their hormones started bouncing around. And we know that estrogen modulates dopamine. So this makes a lot of sense. Another good way to find a knowledgeable ADHD professional is to call your nearest medical school and ask for the Department of Psychiatry. Ask if they have anyone on staff that they can refer that treats women or children. You can also call your state medical society and or your state psychiatry society and ask the same thing. Rachel Germeroth, um, she is one of our former Your ADHD Brain is AOK students. I think she's now studying to be a coach. And actually, I met her in AOK, but she's also a member of our big 80,000 member Facebook group. And so what she did is she went into our group and other groups, and she started building a professional ADHD directory. She's building it using Google Forms and Sheets, and it's a list of professionals who our members have had success with. So it's other ADHD women who've said, hey, I'm in Australia, or I'm in Germany, or I'm in New York City, and this is who I used, and I thought this medical professional was really great. Now, it's a small list of professionals, but it's all over the world, and you might start there. Maybe you can find someone on that list, and the URL is spyhappy.me forward slash ADHD profs list. So A-D-H-D-P-R-O-F-S-L-I-S-T. So one of the questions that you want to ask of any professional that you're considering working with is, how many women with ADHD have you treated? And if it's for your child, how many children with ADHD have you treated? This right there tells you an awful lot. I mean, if they're not telling me hundreds, I'm a little suspect. At least a hundred, right? Attitude, Chad, and Ada also have professional resource directories. ADA is the Attention Deficit Disorder Association. I hate these names. CHAD is Children and Adults with Attention Deficit Hyperactivity Disorder. Attitude um, Mag has a, a directory, and you can find them at attitudemag.com. And if you're looking for an ADHD coach, I would recommend ADCA which is the ADD Coach Academy. I think their program is outstanding. It's where I was trained. And um, you want to make sure that if you're working with a ADHD coach, they have had training in ADHD. And so the other coaches that I've met that have come from that program, they understand how the ADHD brain works. I've seen so many coaches who do not have training in ADHD who call themselves out um, or hold themselves out as ADHD coaches. And again, the ADHD brain works differently. Prior to learning about ADHD coaching, prior to becoming an ADHD coach, I really felt like I was uncoachable because I had worked with a coach that was, you know, a general life coach, and she did not understand how the ADHD brain worked. What you can also do is you can take a look at who's writing the books and blog posts, who's speaking at the ADHD conferences about ADHD, because they're also seeing patients. So much of the information that we find today is online. So if you see an expert that you really relate to who's out of state, it would be so nice. You know, you think that, oh, it'd be so nice to just work with them. 
And you definitely can, as long as you aren't taking stimulant medication. Stimulant medication is a Schedule II medication per the DEA, which has the highest level of regulation for any prescribed medication. So most states don't allow physicians to prescribe Schedule II meds without an in-person visit. So there's that. I do think that over time, hopefully this will change with more education. But again, you can get yourself diagnosed in one place and then go to a psychiatrist with that diagnosis. They may request more from you, but you're going to need a psychiatrist or a medical doctor to prescribe medication. So I hope that makes sense. Okay. The big thing that I'm here for though, is I want to tell you that you must go in prepared. You know, I did a lot of research and went into my appointment understanding what the symptoms of ADHD were generally, but also how they presented for me. Look, if you're nervous going in and then you meet with a psychologist or a psychiatrist who doesn't understand ADHD, your short and long-term memory, they're going to fail and you won't remember anything. This won't happen if you go in prepared. So if someone asks me what the symptoms of ADHD are, even though I'm immersed in this every day. Sometimes, depending on, you know, who's asking me and where I am, I'm still going to rattle around. I mean, there are some days I can barely remember what street I live on, right? It just depends. However, if someone asks me, is blurting out a symptom of ADHD, I won't ever forget that. Of course it is, right? So my point is make it easy for yourself. And I'm going to help you with this. So just stick with me. What I've done is I've created a checklist for you to go through before your appointment so you can check off your symptoms, how your specific ADHD presents, okay? So if there are symptoms that aren't listed and you think they might be ADHD, there's space for you to just add them. What I'm giving you, it's not a comprehensive checklist. It's a place to help you organize your thoughts because I know your brain. And if you have a structure you can do this. So what I'm doing is I'm giving you the structure. And by the way, this checklist is for adults only. So what I've done in creating this checklist is I've gone through the DSM-5, which is the Diagnostic and Statistical Manual of Mental Disorders, another name I love. And I think I also went through Russell, it was a while ago that I created this. I think I also went to Russell Barkley's adult scale. And then off of those two, I created a checklist with the criteria for ADHD in adult women. So five or more symptoms of inattention and or hyperactivity or impulsivity must be present. These symptoms must be present for at least six months. These symptoms must be present before the age of 12. There are many ADHD experts who believe that symptoms in girls, they often don't appear until puberty, which can be much later than age 12, right? For me personally, I was 13 before the big symptoms started showing up. These symptoms, however, have to be present in at least two or more settings. That means two or more settings out of home, school, work, friends, or, you know, when you're doing other activities. There is no requirement that the symptoms at this age cause impairment. They just have to be present at that age. And there's, there's good reason for that, which I'm going to go into. Finally, for an ADHD diagnosis, you must have clear evidence that the symptoms interfere with or reduce the quality of social, academic, or occupational function. So this is a change from the DSM-4, and it explains the increase in ADHD diagnoses. The DSM-4 required clear evidence of clinically significant impairment in social, academic, or occupational functioning. So I want to use myself as an example. I had many symptoms of ADHD that were present before the age of 12. However, they didn't become impairing until my mid-40s. In my mid-40s, the symptoms interfered with or reduced the quality of social, academic, or occupational functioning. I don't know why I have a problem with that word, and thus qualified for the ADHD diagnosis. So there's also a good chance that if you're a woman and you go in wanting to talk about ADHD, your doctor is going to suggest that it's anxiety or depression, and it might be. But remember, ADHD is a comorbid condition. That means that it can still exist with anxiety and depression. And from everything that I've read, and the medical professionals that I've talked to, you treat the ADHD first because the cause of the anxiety or the depression could very well be the frustration of living with ADHD. Now, 
I'm not a doctor, but I know how your ADHD brain works because I share it. So my goal here is just to give you a framework or a structure to recognize and discuss your symptoms with your doctor. I know that once you have a structure, you can do this. So you can download the how to prepare for a meeting with your doctor checklist, the one that I created just for you. You can download it at spyhappy.me forward slash checklist. Again, spyhappy.me forward slash checklist. It's also going to be, the link will be on our show notes. So the whole point of creating this checklist is, I know that for me, and I know that for many of you, if someone asks you, do you pay attention to details or do you have difficulty sustaining attention? And then they want to know, well, give me an example. I, I can't think, especially if there's any anxiety. So if I'm sitting in a doctor's office and they're asking me those kinds of questions, I can't remember it. I can't even at that point remember what is ADHD even, right? So what I did is I created this checklist and I mirrored the DSM. But for example, when it says does not pay attention to details as one of the symptoms, I have how it shows up for me and other women. So do you often have appointments and days mixed up on your calendar? This is for does not pay attention to details. Do you have trouble reading and then remembering what you read? Do you lock your keys in the car? Do you turn the water on and forget that it's on? Do you find your phone in your hand when you're looking for it? Do you misread directions, right? And then for things like has difficulty sustaining attention. Okay, what does that even mean? The doctor said, okay, give me an example of that. I don't know. But if you ask me, do you hate to be interrupted? Yeah. Do you struggle to balance your checkbook or stay on top of bank accounts? Yeah. Do you drink excessive amounts of coffee? I don't do that one. Do you change jobs more than your peers? Do you purchase many books but rarely finish one? Are you constantly rewashing loads of laundry? Those things I can totally say yes to, right? But if you ask me, give me examples of when you find it's difficult to sustain attention, I would just sit there like a deer in the headlights. So that is exactly why I created this checklist. Okay, so one last thing I want to mention. Once you are diagnosed, ask about alternatives to medication and follow-up care. We've often heard pills don't teach skills, right? One of the things that our ADHD brains struggle with are executive function skills. And taking medication does not teach that. It makes it easier to do certain things, but you can learn how to have better executive functioning skills. It is teachable. Study after study indicates that medication works best with cognitive behavioral therapy, exercise, good sleep, good hydration. You want to learn what can you do to make your medication even more successful, okay? Make sure and ask about follow-up visits. How do they work? What happens if the medication doesn't work or causes symptoms? And then also ask about what the process is for refilling prescriptions. Again, I really want to encourage you to educate yourself before you go in to see your doctor. It's not going to take much for you to know whether ADHD is something that explains everything that you've questioned in your life. When we know it, we know it. If you're looking for a strength-focused book list to educate yourself on ADHD, you can go to tracyoutsuka.com forward slash book hyphen list. As always, you're listening to ADHD for Smartass Women. If you like this episode, please let me know by leaving a review. My goal is to change the conversation around ADHD by helping as many women as I possibly can learn how their ADHD brains work. And you know what? Your reviews really help in that regard. If you have a comment, a guest you'd like me to interview, or a topic for this podcast, please go to my website at tracyoutsuka.com and reach out to me on our contact page. Thank you so much for listening, and I'll see you here next week. You've been listening to the ADHD for Smartass Women podcast. I'm your host, Tracy Outsuka, and we're available on iTunes, Stitcher, Spotify, and Google Podcasts. 
Not coincidentally, ADHD for Smart Ass Women, it's also the name of our free Facebook group. We're a totally smart ass community of successful, ambitious women who share our ADHD wins, questions, and workarounds. Join us at tracyoutsuka.com, where you can also find more information on our Your ADHD Brain is A OK system. I spy a happier life for us, and I'll see you again next week.